This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. When someone tells me I can have a Harvard Medical School professor and doctor and national drug litigation expert come on this show, somebody who has written a book called Sickening about the pharmaceutical industry, guess what my response was? Of course, a big yes. My guest today is John Abramson. And trust me, John has things to say that will have you questioning every aspect of health and health care regardless of what country you are in. John's message, and I can't say this any more directly, is frightening. It's you. It's up to you. And John lays the foundation for why it's up to you. We're a couple years in now to the COVID situation, and this is a perfect time for this conversation. Without any further delay, let's jump right in with my guest today, John Abramson. Let's jump right into the deep end, John. I want to quote from your book real quick. I think this just sets up where we're going to go today. And just did an interview with Greg Zuckerman, who wrote a book called The Shot That Saved the World. You might share some views with his work, but you definitely give a much different take about what's going on with the pharmaceutical industry and our health and our health care. But let me read this quote from your book, because I think this is a nice way to get people into your headspace. Quote, Big Pharma does not set out to purposely harm Americans' health, but its primary job has become the exploitation of each situation as a unique opportunity to maximize profits, regardless of the overall impact on society. There's not a lot of people that are saying that today. I think that's right. The COVID vaccinations, which are clearly effective, still provide a window into how pharma conducts its business and prioritizes its goals. Can I push on the word purposely? With the amount of money there is to be made, and you lay out a pretty stark, almost frightening case in your work, but with that word purposely, is that debatable? In the case of the vaccinations, Big Pharma's goal, I don't believe its goal, is to create a situation in which COVID keeps going around the world with different variations. So I don't think that what's happening now is purposeful, but I think that their goal of maximizing their profits means that vaccinations are going to be unequally distributed to wealthy countries because that's where the most profit is. Low and middle income countries will have less access to vaccines. Africa has now an 8% vaccination rate. And the consequence of that is going to harm Americans. It's going to keep coming back. The low vaccination rates in the third world are going to create breeding grounds for more variants like Omicron to come along. The negative consequence of this is collateral damage of the drug companies doing what their primary job is, which is to maximize the profits that they return to their shareholders. Well, I guess that gets back to me pushing on the part about their interest in American health. If the primary job is to maximize profits and they are setting out by their actions to leave us with this collateral damage, and they know that clearly, kind of seems like a roundabout way, almost political in a way where we're just not cutting to the chase, saying that these folks, and you do, you're very direct. I'm not saying you're not direct. I'm even trying to get more direct. It's a frightening case that you lay out about where we are and how we've got here with the pharmaceutical industry controlling our health and our health care? Yes, they're in the position of controlling how medical science becomes accessible to Americans through the therapeutics of the pharmaceutical industry. They are not in the business of improving Americans' health. Can you imagine 
a basketball game, a professional basketball game in which the players who are paid to win called their own fouls, it wouldn't work. If pitchers in the major leagues called their own balls and strikes, it wouldn't work because they're paid to win. Farm is paid to win. It's paid to maximize the profits that it returns to its investors. It's not paid to improve Americans' health. It's not paid to get Americans' healthy life expectancies ranking in the world up from 68th. That's not its job. And I think we doctors especially are guilty of not understanding that, that it's not their job. And right now, we don't have adequate oversight of what the consequences of their actions are. If your voice was spread widely, and obviously you're going to be working to do that with your new book, but if your voice was spread widely in the last 18 months, and maybe you've got some examples of this, I just imagine there's all kinds of literal deletes and, quote, fact checks of John on things that you're saying. I mean, there's many things that you say in your book that I have a sneaky suspicion that if I post on Twitter or Facebook, I might be banned. You're not like a flamethrower or anything. You're just being matter of a fact. You've got the credentials to say these things. But it does seem like this is not an open conversation right now in America. Right. It's a very impolite conversation. I mean, that's why I put John Adams' quote at the front of the book, which is, don't be dissuaded from publishing what you know to be true. What I said about the vaccinations, it's a fact that Operation Warp Speed paid first dollar, which I don't criticize, to develop the vaccines quickly. But the federal government just abrogated its responsibility to make sure that the patents would be extended in a practical way to the third world so that we could have global vaccination rates. We're a little bit greedy in the United States, and I'm a little bit greedy, and I want to be vaccinated and boosted. But we could have, at the same time, ensured that the third world would be able to manufacture its own supply of vaccinations, and that we wouldn't have this situation where the first world is vaccinated and the third world isn't, and it's like we're swimming in the no-peeing zone of a swimming pool. We're going to get dirty. John, do you accept this collateral damage that maybe half the world thinks that what is happening in the corona times is just nonsense? Meaning they're not buying the stories anymore. They're not buying, okay, two weeks to flatten the curve. Okay, first vax, second vax, third vax, fourth vax. Is collateral damage also that the trust has been broken with the average person? Yes, it is. That's such an important point. The political climate that we now work in is defined by this lack of trust. My goal in writing this book, in talking with you, the message that I would like to leave people with is that the system is not working very well, but it doesn't mean that we have to throw out all the beneficial scientific progress that's made. It doesn't mean that nothing that pharma does is important to our health. But we've got to learn how to be more intelligent because we're not having adequate oversight of the integrity of the medical knowledge. And we're not having adequate oversight of the distribution of these products. What's really interesting when you talk about government abrogating their responsibility, I think one area they did that is clearly the profits that are flowing to Pfizer and Moderna would not be flowing without NIH research. The NIH research was the foundation of how they got those vax out so fast and how they filled up their Goldman Sachs accounts so quickly with so many billions. The American taxpayer paid for the research. Am I off base? You're not off base. Not only are you 100% on base, but pharma had the gall to take that moment when the vaccines were recognized to be effective launch a PR campaign that said, don't take us for granted and don't cut the price. Don't let the government negotiate Medicare drug prices because you won't get the innovation like the vaccines. Like I said in the introduction of the book, the right thing to say is don't take the NIH for granted, not don't take pharma for granted. I know this is not necessarily a prime point of your book, but you mentioned, and I talked with a lot of people, you mentioned just a second ago, you've said several times, the vaccines being effective. Now, you surely know there's a lot of people that don't believe that to be true at this moment in time because the vaccinations don't seem to stop. When you're hearing that Israel is on to number four, when I pick up your book and I start reading about statins 
And I'm thinking back to when I went to the family physician in my early 30s, and he was like, hey, you need to be on statins. And I was like, whoa, whoa. And I did a little research, and I was like, I'm in my early, early 50s now. I said, I'm not going on statins. I'm not doing that. I'll get healthy. I'll lose weight. This is not what I'm doing. And also as a kid who grew up in the 80s with the same Dr. Fauci, pretty much in control of infectious diseases at that point in time, you know, I'm a kid who grew up in the 80s watching the HIV rollout. When I say rollout, I mean, I was made deathly afraid when I was a teenager that I was going to get HIV from who knows what. There was a real push to make HIV something that everybody should be afraid of. Now, when we look back in time, okay, maybe everybody should not be afraid of HIV. The high-risk groups are still the high-risk groups. I know you're going to have something to say about statins. Is there the chance we're going to look back in time and say, for all the times right now that we're saying these vaccines for COVID are effective, is there a possibility in the not-too-distant future we might be saying they were not effective? The answer for me right now is that when you take all the evidence that People who are unvaccinated in the United States have 14 times the risk of dying compared to people who are vaccinated and 20 times the risk compared to vaccinated and boosted people. So I think there's no question that at this point in time, getting vaccinated and boosted, especially if you're older for the boosters, that the weight of evidence is that they're beneficial. When we look over the long haul, when we look back on this episode, is it possible that vaccinations delayed our population reaching an equilibrium that brought us back to normal life and that we could have gotten there quicker without the vaccinations? I guess it's possible, but if I were a betting man, I'd bet 10 to 1 against that. I'm a little older than you are. I'm not willing to risk it. Let me push a little bit more on you in terms of when you're describing the chance of, I guess, dying from COVID versus uh, vax versus unvax. I think the troubling aspect that I have with that, I'm in the States at this moment in time, but for the last two and a half years, all of 2020 and all of 2021, except for the last month, I was in Asia. And so I had just a different perspective at looking at things. And specifically, I was in Vietnam, a very thin country. Is there not a mistake that we're making here, though, too, with America being a very obese country? Are we not making a mistake where we're just grouping everybody together in the sense that this is an equal opportunity employing a disease when it's clearly not? That's a part that's really rubbed me wrong about the messaging of this. If I look at kids, why do skinny 10-year-old kids in America need this fax right now? Is it simply to protect perhaps the teacher that's not in shape? It's defining the risk groups that's really got me frustrated. And I frankly, I think a lot of people are frustrated by the lack of definition when it comes to what is a risk group with this disease. I think that's a very fair comment. If we could target our vaccinations better and target our recommendations better, we might be able to grade the value of vaccinations for different parts of the population. There's no question that obesity and diabetes and heart disease, which are more prevalent in the United States than in the other countries, are risk factors for COVID and are going to contribute to that mortality data. But I found interesting mortality data from Scotland, which is not nearly as obese as we are and has far less inequality of wealth. Still in Scotland, unvaccinated people, there aren't many, their vaccination rate is over 90%, but unvaccinated people in Scotland have a 2.8 times risk of mortality compared to vaccinated people. I think when we paint this as a, yes, you must get vaccinated, everybody must get vaccinated, or nobody should, we're making a real mistake. The question that you ask introduces these gradations of risk. That's a very valid comment. Are you feeling, with as direct as you are, are you feeling any pressure from peers, from media? Are people open to having a conversation with you? Not yet. I'm really scared by COVID. This is new territory. I believe it's a very serious disease. You might argue that 800,000 deaths are tallied for Americans aren't all because of COVID, but may have been with COVID. And there may be some percentage diminution of that if we really know the truth. But I believe that this is a very serious disease. We're playing with fire. Reasonable people 
ought to disagree on where they fall in the spectrum of what actions you should take. But my training as a physician says, be careful here. This is dangerous. And if I make a mistake, there's a lot more danger in the population being under-vaccinated than over-vaccinated. Let me take you back to a drug that I brought up a few minutes ago in my particular situation. I think right now the numbers are 50% of Americans between the ages of 40 and 70 are on a statin. And I think the other number you throw in is that 60% of those have no history of heart issues that would require the statin. Let's unpack that because we can circle back to COVID. You've got a much wider perspective than just right now, which I think is really useful for the audience. So let's unpack statins. Let me just correct the premise of the question. It's 50% of Americans now are recommended for statins by the current guidelines. Not necessarily on, but recommended. Right. What percentage do you think are on? Gee, I would guess it's 30, but that's just a guess. But then we're quibbling if it's 50% or 30%. It's still a huge number. It's a lot. Yeah. No, I just wanted to make sure people understood. Sure. Let's unpack that, though, because I still remember pretty vividly just a normal checkup, some blood work, and the doctor just looked at me and he said, 32. He's like, you got to go on statins the rest of your life. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what's a statin? All of a sudden, I'm Googling and whatnot, or probably not Google at that moment in time, but some search engine. Speak to this issue and how we got to that particular point with statins. An important issue is transparency of clinical trial data. Very few doctors understand that when papers are published in even the most respected medical journals, the data have not been made available to the peer reviewers or medical journal editors. They're in the position of verifying the accuracy and completeness of the data without having being able to analyze the accuracy and the completeness of the data. That's a fundamental point that applies across the whole pharmaceutical industry. It does, and it makes no sense. I mean, the Royal Society of London in 1660 adopted the motto. This is when the physicists, Isaac Newton and Boyle and the great physicists doing their work, they adopted the motto of nullius in verba, which means take nobody's word for it, saying that we new enlightenment physicists, scientists are making this progress because we're opening our data and we're opening ourselves to criticism from our colleagues. And now state of transparency of medical science is pre-enlightenment. The data are not available. Part of the reason why you and I are having this conversation right now is because I spent more than 10 years as an expert in pharmaceutical litigation, and I got to see what that data shows. And I got to see how absolutely necessary it is for physicians to have access or for people who represent them to have access to the real data. With that as a preface, the statin data is not available. And there's a group centered in Oxford called the Cholesterol Treatment Trialist Collaboration. And they figured out that each statin study, studies for each brand of statin, don't have enough people in them to prove the benefit of statins, to reduce death, to figure out whether statins are beneficial for women or low-risk men. The CTT, the Cholesterol Treatment Trialists, made an arrangement with the trialists that they would receive their data, they would analyze it, put it together so it had the statistical power to make the argument that the statins would be beneficial for broader and broader populations. They received this data upon the stipulation that they would not release the data. The CTT meta-analyses are ultimately why your doctor was saying you should be on a statin because the CTT was saying that statins are beneficial for people at low risk. When the guidelines that came out in 2013, just before they came out, I worked with three colleagues to look at the CTT's data, only seeing what they had published. We didn't have any access to underlying data, but we could see that the benefit for people who are low risk of cardiovascular disease, meaning they didn't have a history of cardiovascular disease and their risk was less than 20% over the next 10 years, that they had a minimal benefit from statins, not a mortality benefit. And you had to treat about 100 people for five years in the situation 
that you may have been in in your 30s in order for one person to avoid a non-fatal heart attack. We published that paper. We weren't saying nobody should be on statins. We were just saying everybody should know that the number needed to treat is between 100 and 140 to prevent one non-fatal cardiovascular event over the next five years. The CTT came at us and tried to have that article retracted. It was pretty ugly for about six months. The British Medical Journal, who published our article, appointed a six-member panel to adjudicate the CTT, or Sir Rory Collins' demand for retraction of that paper. They unanimously voted that the paper should not be retracted, that it stands, that our primary findings stand. But your doctor would have seen the CTT's article published in The Lancet and the references to it and the guidelines, the American guidelines that are based on those CTT reports. But it's very unlikely that your doctor knows, especially if they're in the United States, that this controversy went on about this paper, not only to understand the low benefit that you get, that low risk people get from taking statins, but to understand how aggressively the medical establishment will act to try and suppress criticism of its findings, of the way it is presenting the data. You are very calm, cool, diplomatic, at least sounding to me, but at the highest levels of society, that just sounds like outright manipulation to make money. Because if today, and I think this is what you're saying, today we cannot see the statin data, the raw data that allows, let's say the number is 30% for talking, that allows 30% of Americans to be taking statins. And this is producing untold profits for big pharma. I mean, I just want to throw my hands up and say, where does trust come from? As an average person like me, hearing your work, hearing from you directly, why should I not just want to throw my hands up, literally give the middle finger to the entire industry? A, because they make some good products and we need them, like the vaccines. B, it's even worse than you're saying. <laughs> the BMJ got drawn into this thing. Professor Collins tried to get the editor fired because she wouldn't retract our article. When the dust settled on this whole thing and their panel of six people voted unanimously that the demand for retraction was not justified, the BMJ wrote to 32 lead investigators of statin trials and said, now we understand what's going on. Now we understand that the data are not transparent. Basically said what you just said. How can we possibly trust this system? And how can we ask patients to trust their doctors when the data are not available? They wrote to 32 lead investigators and said, okay, let's work together to make the statin data transparent. People's doctors can have access to the data or access to people who analyze the data, the analyses, and have rational discussions with their patients. So the BMJ editors write, and a year later, after multiple letters and phone calls and emails, only seven of the trialists had even responded to the BMJ. The other 25 didn't even take the time to respond to the BMJ's request for access to the data. That happened in 2015, and there it lay. The data remained non-transparent. When you say, why don't people throw their arms up? That's exactly where I come down in the book, is we've all got together. Consumers whose doctors don't have access to data analysis based on the real data. Doctors who have a legal responsibility as learned intermediaries think that they are taking the science and applying it as best they can to their patients and don't understand that they're looking on the shadows like Plato's slaves, thinking the shadows on the cave wall are reality. The doctors are looking at the shadows of the data and not the data. And the purchasers of drugs don't understand that we don't know what these drugs are really worth. And businesses, business, non-healthcare related businesses should be all over this because they're getting killed. They're becoming non-competitive because of American healthcare costs. It's not based on the data. How does the average person do this? I'm sure you've seen what I'm about to say, and I've seen this in some of the notes about your work, which is 
the point made that during COVID time and during the COVID vax time, social media was effectively flooded with free marketing. That free marketing came in the form of if you were me, whoever, were to question any of what's going on, to question Fauci, to question the vax, to question what are the risk groups, anything, you were either deleted, banned, or fact-checked to make you look like you've got a scarlet letter and you're crazy. So, I mean, the average person, literally, the way we communicate in the modern age, I don't see where they have the ability to question this system or they're going to be cut off. And even doing this podcast episode with you, I mean, I guess there's a chance at some point in time when all the AI gets up to snuff, they'll read through this podcast and say, I don't know, Mike crossed the line. He questioned the Borg. This is part of the frightening aspect about this is that it really does feel like communication is scuttled. I agree. What's happening in American healthcare, just to go up to the satellite level, is that we are paying, compared to the 10 comparable countries, 10 wealthy countries, we're paying about 7% more of our GDP annually for healthcare than the other 10 countries. 7% of our GDP means we're spending an excess $1.5 trillion a year. That would be like if President Biden's plan cost $15 trillion over 10 years, $15 trillion. So we're spending $1.5 trillion a year extra on our health care. And for that, we have the worst functioning health care. The healthy life expectancy of Americans has fallen while we've been spending all this extra money from 38th in the world in 2000 to 68th in the world in 2019. The truth is, right now, about 1,300 Americans are dying every day from COVID. And for the four years before COVID, 1,300 Americans were dying every day because our health care and health is so inferior to the other wealthy nations. So we have a crisis that is as acute as the COVID crisis that's been going on because of the dysfunction in our health care, and it's ruining our country. We have got to address this. When you say, how do we do this? I think we do it by starting exactly where you and I are right now, that most of the people who hear this podcast are going to say, holy moly, I had no idea this was going on. Had I known this was going on, I wouldn't have been so gobsmacked by medical technology, and I wouldn't have been so complacent about the increases in my health insurance costs, and I would have gotten in touch with my legislative representatives. We've got to get on a different mental framework that we've got a historic crisis in the cost and the quality of our health care, and it's ruining our country. Let me give some pushback, and you can give pushback to me if needed. As I said, spent the last eight years in Asia primarily. When you're in the typical Asian country, you see one tribe in each country primarily. I've seen you make comparisons to Japan. For me, as somebody who spent a lot of time in Japan, I don't see the comparison from America to Japan in any way, shape, or form. I see people make comparisons from America to Sweden and Denmark or to Australia. I mean, Australia is fairly obese, and so is New Zealand. But I find some of these comparisons difficult because here I am living for the last eight years in World Health Organization statistics. Vietnam is the least obese country in the world. My home country where I'm at today is the most obese country in the world, except for a few South Pacific islands. So I find the comparisons difficult. I mentioned the tribe aspect. America is not one tribe. It's many tribes. It's many different ethnic groups thrown in one melting pot. Most of the countries that we try to compare to are not that. The biggest issue that I see, which I think the data that we do have is probably bearing this out, but it's data that is not readily given to us, is the people that are getting the most sick during COVID are folks that are dealing with obesity. And obesity definitely is running hot in America. So I hear what you're saying about, you know, what can leaders do and what can we do with our healthcare system? But then it's like, At some point in time, what happens to the individual? Why is America so obese? I live in this thin country. Why is America so obese? It's just, I shake my head sometimes. I mean, I guess there's all kinds of psychological reasons why it is, but here we are. Correct. 
And I hear you asking two questions. One is, why are we so obese? And the other is that it's unfair when I give my statistics that we rank 68th in healthy life expectancy. It's unfair to compare us to more homogeneous countries, be they racially homogeneous, economically homogeneous, whatever. It's unfair to compare our health to those other countries' health. Let me address that issue first. I don't disagree with a word you just said. The heterogeneity of American society clearly contributes to our poor health. The problem is that literally, this is an accurate number, I'm not estimating, 96% of our healthcare research is about new drugs and devices. And why? Because that's where the money is. 4% is about improving population health. But as you point out, Mike, probably 80% of our health has to do with non-medical factors. A critic might say to me, well, then why are you blaming it on healthcare? That's a fair comment. But the point is that the purpose of healthcare ought to be to improve the population's health. And we've let the market allocate our research funds so that we're just looking for fancier and fancier and more expensive drugs. And that's not going to solve these underlying problems that you very articulately point out. If we're going to solve this, we cannot leave the allocation of our research efforts to the market because the market's going to invest money where it's going to get the highest financial return, not the highest health return. This is a failure, a unique failure of the American system. Yeah, you do a great job in your work of pointing that out for people that have not been paying attention, perhaps like myself, is to really think about, look, okay, I want to be in my mind, I want to be as Milton Friedman as I possibly can be, you know, let the markets work. Okay. But when I read in your work about how Pfizer and Moderna was not going to be minting billionaires without U.S. government research that was paid for by all the taxpayers, well, then you say to yourself, well, hold on, it wasn't a market system to begin with. Exactly. Milton Friedman said in Freedom and Capitalism, or Capitalism and Freedom, he said there's three legitimate functions of government. Preserve law and order, ensure that markets function effectively, and make sure that private contracts are honored. In the situation that we're now in, we're failing on each of those three functions. The markets can't function because A, the information's about a very narrow category of medical intervention that maximizes profits and the data aren't transparent. Law and order is not being preserved. The penalties, there's been $38 billion in fines and settlements, but those penalties are not nearly enough to discourage excessive marketing and misrepresenting of data. An important concept is the fulfillment of contracts because the drug company would claim it's fulfilling its contract. It's selling when it sells 100 pills, it delivers 100 pills, and people take 100 pills. But the heart of that contract is what those pills do. The drug company is making claims about those pills without making their data transparent so that some oversight organization that assesses the cost effectiveness and the value of new therapies does not have the opportunity to assess what the value of that product is. There's no way to know whether the pharmaceutical industry is fulfilling their contracts. And the average person just assumes that's because of money. I mean, for example, I've been hearing the stories, and I don't know the specifics, about Pfizer data that won't be released for 75 years. And then I saw somebody making the case, well, the government, they can't deal with freedom of information requests. They're just going to wait 75 years. I mean, this, this is mass insanity to ask, in many cases, mandate for people to take a new vaccine. Okay, fair enough. But then to say, well, you can't see the data for 75 years, there's absolutely no reason why anyone should trust. Yes. And there's absolutely no reason why anyone should tolerate this situation. Why am I the one who's having this conversation with you now? I think it's primarily because I got to see the data. In litigation, the experts get access to like 20 million documents to the hard drives of the relevant people within the different companies who were involved in the drug in question. I could put together what happened. My job was to get to the scientific data 
and to get the scientific data to a statistician who could analyze it, but to see what the scientific data showed, show how that scientific data compared to the articles that were published in well-reputed journals, to see how that scientific data was translated into guidelines and translated into marketing material, and then how the drug sold, how much of it was sold and how much it was sold for. How many drugs have you done that for in your expert witness career? Probably 15. 15 different drugs where you've had the chance due to litigation to get behind the scenes and see the very data for those drugs that are typically hidden from even our doctors. Yes. Yes. I worked on a drug called Bextra. It was a cousin of, in civil litigation, plaintiffs were suing for economic and physical harm. I did a lot of work on that. I signed a confidentiality agreement. I would never break a confidentiality agreement, but I figured out what happened. And there was a settlement for 8,000 plaintiffs settled for some amount of money. I picked up the phone, called the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston and said, I don't know what you're looking at, but I know a lot about Bextra. If you subpoena me, I will come in and tell you what I know. I can't tell you unless you subpoena me. And they did. And I came in and I testified to the Department of Justice and the FBI. They give you no feedback whatsoever on what they're doing. And six months later, I read in the newspaper that Pfizer had been hit with the biggest criminal fine in U.S. history for what it had done with Bextra. Now, I still can't tell you what they did with Bextra. I know, but I can't tell you because I'm still bound by that confidentiality agreement. But that's just an example of why the data are so important. Doctors have fallen in to settling for what they call evidence-based medicine, which means trusting well-conducted, well-designed studies that are published in peer-reviewed journals without understanding. Let me take a step back. I didn't follow something you said. So you were working for, you couldn't speak to the issue because you were under an NDA. Then you got subpoenaed by the feds. Obviously, the feds used what you told them. And then this big fine appeared. And But to some degree, us, the people out there, so to speak, we can't really understand or see how the sausage was made. Right. Pfizer was fined $1.2 billion for this. But they kept hidden how serious the sausage making is in terms of depriving doctors and patients of the data they need to know whether they want that drug is indicated or not. The non-disclosure agreement, it's not really a non-disclosure agreement, it's called a confidentiality agreement, but same thing. I had signed that when plaintiff's attorneys who were suing Pfizer representing purchases of Bextra and plaintiffs who were injured saying that they didn't get their money's worth, they didn't get the benefit of the bargain. When I begin a case, I have to sign a confidentiality agreement with Pfizer and say, I promise not to disclose this confidential information in return for which, as an expert, I will be shown this information and be able to analyze it. Ultimately, what happened here is the reason that you get bound at something like that is that Pfizer knows they're going to pay a fine. The plaintiff's attorneys and the plaintiffs, they're happy to keep everything under wraps as long as they get a payout. So in turn, there's a transfer of money, but the general population doesn't get to know what happened, which really doesn't help us at all, does it? You've got it 100% right, except for one thing. You and I are having this discussion now, and people can hear it. Yeah. You're frightening. What you know is frightening, because as I'm sitting here, the only thing I'm thinking to myself is, okay, if a cancer happens, something that's tangible, that, okay, I might have to be dealing with some type of drug therapy in the future, something like that. I get it. But every other aspect of my life, when I listen to you, is like, okay, I'm already in pretty good shape, but it's like, I need to get in better shape. I need to manage myself even a lot better than I currently am because the system out there, the healthcare system, is not looking to manage me. They're looking to hold me upside down and see how many quarters fall out of my pocket. That's correct. But there's another reason, and this is very important for people listening to this podcast. The reason for you to take over responsibility for your health is because that's the most effective way for you to stay healthy. Even if all the pharmaceutical data were transparent and the research agenda reflected the health needs of the population, still, 
the most effective way for you to stay healthy is for you to take responsibility for your health. Nine vax billionaires so far. Is that correct? I think it's nine. Well, nine vax billionaires from just vaccines, but another eight gained 32 billion in their investments in vaccines. 17 people as of sometime last summer, 17 people gained $50 billion in wealth from the vaccines. 17 people, 50 billion from the COVID vaccines. Yes. That's my numbing. That's my numbing. It gets much more numbing because the IMF and the World Bank and the uh, World Health Organization put out a joint statement last spring and said, if we don't get 40% of low-income countries, of all countries vaccinated by the end of 2021, we're going to lose $9 trillion in economic wealth. Besides the health problems, we're going to lose $9 trillion in economic wealth. Just so happens that what they were asking for was $50 billion. The $50 billion that had been taken out of the system to create unimaginable wealth for individuals could have been used to meet the goals that the World Health Organization and World Bank and the IMF were begging for. They were saying that each country has to have a 40% vaccination rate in order for us to prevent this disaster. The vaccination rate in Africa right now is 8%. Let me shift you out of that frightening thought into another piece of collateral damage that I've observed since I've been in the States. And i don't know if this is directly a part of your work, but I'm sure you've got a perspective and a feeling on it. And I think it's definitely collateral damage. I've noticed now and I've taken to, and maybe Americans that have been here during the whole COVID time frame have not done this, but I've taken to, if I'm driving, say I'm in a four lane road or whatever, and the cars are coming towards me and it's not that fast, 30 or 40 miles an hour. I've taken to observing how many cars that are approaching me in the other lane going the other direction. What percentage of those drivers are alone wearing a mask. To me, it looks like it's 30 to 50%. Now, there can be all kinds of reasons for this, that it's just easier to leave it on and all that kind of stuff. I get it. But I think there's something else going on there. And one of the aspects of collateral damage that I think I'm observing is going to be the long-term mental health challenges that are probably coming out of this two-year window so far. I agree 100%. I think individual mental health problems And I think the fracture of our country is getting to the irreparable point where we're fighting over masks as a political issue. We're losing sight on this disaster that's happening to our country and how we can best get through it with the least amount of harm. We need a whole country to work together on that. And we're not even close. We're arguing about where you should wear masks. And I agree 100% with you, Michael, makes no sense for people to be wearing a mask in a car alone. I think that that's an extreme. They're scared. They're scared, as are the people who are holding signs in front of the school committee saying, don't make our children wear masks. I happen to agree with those folks, by the way. But we're getting polarized on all sides of this thing. How we can come together Instead of allowing each issue to fracture us worse, I don't know the answer to that. I'll share something with you. You're probably aware of this. And I first saw it in Japan years ago. You'd be on the subway or something. You'd see somebody wearing a mask. And it took me a while to learn that people were doing that as kind of a self-care type thing. If they were sick, they would wear the mask to protect others from themselves. If you're sick, wear the mask so other people don't get what you have. That's a pretty normal thing in Asia. I see it in Vietnam a lot. Of course, once COVID happened, it wasn't very difficult to get Asian countries to say, well, let's just put the mask on. Now, of course, it's something very different for America. Here's the part that I struggle with in America in observing this whole scenario. And I've said this on the podcast before. It's the hypocrisy. And I can see examples. I'll give two to you. And I just don't know why we have done this with something like the mask. For example, I remember watching Dr. Fauci throw out the first pitch for a Washington Nationals baseball game, wearing the mask. And then a few innings later, he was in the stands, no mask with his friends. That's just a lot of hypocrisy. I see politicians who will be off stage, no mask. They walk to the podium and put the mask on. This is the part that you don't see in Asia, whereas in Asia, people seem to understand. I'm not even debating whether the efficacy, I'm just saying people in Asia are like, okay, we've 
already got experience with wearing masks. We don't know what's going on. We don't know how much risk reduction a mask might give us. But culturally, we're OK with the mask. We'll put it on. Whereas in America, instead of just being open and honest about it, it just seems like there's this big dog and pony show going on with the mask, which is befuddling to me. Yeah, I think it's at times there's an overreaction from people who would like the United States to respond the way the Asians who you observe are responding. But there's definitely been an overreaction. There's been claims about vaccine safety before it was possible to have data about vaccine safety because people hadn't had the vaccines long enough to know what the long term effects were going to be. There have been excessive cheerleading on the pro-conventional medicine side. And there's been excessive cheerleading on the anti-conventional side as well. It's so harmful to the well-being of our nation and the future of our nation and how we can help, how your efforts and my efforts can help somehow to create an opportunity to rebuild the center, understanding we won't agree on everything, but we're going to be better off if we can find a center that we can all tolerate and move forward together. We're just going in the opposite direction, and it's a disaster. Yeah, you make some great points. And I tell you, people are really going to have to dig into your work. You start off with Viox. It's a personal situation. People are going to have to read on that. We didn't get a chance to jump into it all today. I do have one kind of final point or question I wanted to address. I saw this in some of the notes, and I am curious, as of right now, Pfizer and Moderna have pretty nice reputations. And as you know, a lot of people have made a lot of money, including a lot of pension funds. A lot of average Americans have made a lot of money from Pfizer and Moderna going up. But do you think that these reputations will stay, to use your word, as rosy as they are now? If people understood the truth, I mean, it's great to have your pension fund go up and it's fun to look at your stock market account and see it go up. But what's really happening, I mean, take all the frills away. And what you're doing is you're transferring money from all taxpayers to the people who are wealthy enough to own stock. It's just a massive shift of wealth. We can't go on this way. We've got to find a solution. I'm not saying socialize it. I think you and I would find huge areas of commonality where the market was included. But we've got to find a way to make this market work for everyone who believes in the market. We've got to find a way to make this market work so that it serves the health interests of the American people. And if we don't do that, you're being optimistic. Let me play pessimist for a second. If we don't do that, do we just keep moving into a situation where America gets bigger and bigger and bigger and sicker and sicker and sicker? And then maybe some event, I don't know, some market event pushes us over the edge. Who knows? But if we don't change course, is it just to keep a gradual bigger and bigger and bigger, sicker and sicker and sicker? Or do you perceive some moment in time that if we don't correct course, even something uh, nastier happens? That's why I wrote the book, because we can do it now or we can do it later. But we better do it now because we're bleeding $1.5 trillion a year that could be used to help make Americans' lives better and their health better. We're getting fatter. We lead the Wealthy countries in having a 40% obesity right now, it's soon going to be 50%. Our health is going to go down, 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 and we're going to become less and less competitive. We're seeing, I keep saying it, but these fracture lines in our country are heartbreaking. Part of fixing that, part of starting to heal that is to get our healthcare system focused on making people healthy instead of making investors not just a little wealthier but as wealthy as it can possibly make them by any means necessary. I want to push that point again that I brought up for people out there that are thinking you're proposing socialization of these companies and whatnot. People need to go read your work and find out where the foundation of these drugs come from. It's often the American government. It's often us taxpayers. So there would be no COVID vaccines if not for government NIH. And that is an extremely important point for people that are just, quote, market types and saying, oh, Pfizer and Moderna, they won the game. They did it all. Well, no, hold on. They needed a lot of help to do what they did. Correct. For the people who believe in the market, we need to make this work. We don't have a plan B. 
if the market won't work at this, we're going to fail as a country. We've got to pull together. It is a terribly important read. You bring up things, and I've said multiple times in this conversation, you bring up things and ideas and thoughts and issues that are not at all in the modern American discourse or global discourse. I mean, these are just issues that are either not being discussed or, frankly, being uh, censored. I salute you for jumping in with both feet. The book is called Sickening, How Big Pharma Broke American Healthcare and How We Can Repair It. John, good stuff. Again, I think it's great that you're jumping in because you can see I'm a little bit of a skeptic and I'm curious and you're right there in that headspace. You're not afraid and that's half the battle is for the fear level to come down. If the fear level comes down, maybe America can make some progress. But I got to tell you, if we end up with the vast majority of Americans driving around with a mask alone in a car, I'm not so sure people are ever going to get to your message. Yeah, right. Mike, I want to thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. And I really appreciate your hard questions that I think represent your listeners well and the reservations that they'll have listening to me, because what I'm saying is so discordant with the rosy picture of our being uh, medically exceptional. So thanks for the opportunity. John, is there a place you would like to send people? Is there a website or an email address or anything if they want to reach out to you or find you? Or No, it's a little early. The Amazon website, I should have something up, but I don't. They will always be able to Google you and find the book on Amazon and all that fun stuff. So it's easy enough. If they can't, they failed the test. Uh, if they can't write me, I'll help them. <laughs> yeah. Hey, John, listen, I appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.